In 2018, workers were inspecting an area of land in Alexandria that was going to be developed when they discovered a massive black granite sarcophagus weighing over 30 tons. The world waited with bated breath to find out what was inside this enormous coffin and speculations ran rampant. Some people suggested it contained the body of a lost race of giants, others cried out in fear that it contained an apocalyptic curse, and others hoped to find the remains of Cleopatra. But just 10 days after it was discovered, workers began to pry it open and what they found inside was something that nobody had expected. My name is Zane and this is Unearthing History. On a conspicuously vacant lot crammed between storied buildings on all sides in the city Garba district of Alexandria, an incredible and somewhat ominous discovery lay in wait for more than 2,000 years. Buried 5 metres or 16 feet below the surface, which is a little hard to appreciate over audio, but the pictures of workers descending into the pit show them having to tie two ladders together just to reach the bottom. Once they finally got down there, they were greeted by a large black granite sarcophagus measuring 2.7 metres long, 1.5 metres wide, and 1.8 metres deep, or 9 by 5 by 6 feet. According to the BBC, this is actually the largest sarcophagus ever found. Alongside the sarcophagus was an alabaster sculpture of a man which archaeologists believed at the time might be the person buried inside. At the time of its discovery, there was wild speculation about who or what might be inside this thing. The most common suggestion was Egyptian mummies, given that it's a sarcophagus found in Egypt and that would make the most sense, but others argued that it could be the remains of Alexander the Great or that it was big enough to hold Cleopatra, Mark Antony, and Julius Caesar. Some news outlets even went as far as to suggest that the tomb was cursed and that opening it would result in a zombie apocalypse, which raises the question, why don't people trust news sources anymore? What I found really exciting about this discovery is that when it was found, there was actually a thick layer of mortar between the lid and the bottom of the sarcophagus, which serves as a sort of tamper-proof seal, which would indicate that it most likely hasn't been touched since it was first buried. That is, of course, unless for some unknown reason it was buried, then exhumed, covered in mortar, and then reburied, but we'll come back to that. The coffin itself dates to somewhere between 304 and 30 BCE, so around 2000 years ago. This was a time when the descendants of Ptolemy ruled Egypt, and this is most likely why people speculated that it contained Cleopatra, since she died in the year 30 BCE. A quick side note about Egyptian discoveries though is that pretty much every single discovery is initially tied to Cleopatra. The general public is obsessed with the long lost pharaoh's tomb, and it's definitely a conscious decision by the Egyptian government to play into that obsession with her, so just be mindful to take discoveries that talk about Cleopatra with a grain of salt. When they really do find her tomb, you'll definitely know. Anyway, back to the sarcophagus. Now this thing raised quite a few questions. For example, who is inside this coffin? Are there any artifacts inside? And why is this thing so huge, heavy, and seemingly discarded at random so deep underground? Obviously it wouldn't have been buried this far underground when it was first placed here, but it's not as though it were found inside a lavish tomb or temple, and yet somebody went to painstaking efforts to not only carve this oversized coffin, but move its 30 tons of weight to this exact location. The lid alone of this thing weighs 15 tons, and its enormous size and colour wouldn't have gone unnoticed 2000 years ago, so what exactly is it doing here? Was there a temple or a tomb built around it that's since been lost to time? There's no evidence nearby that's been uncovered, so for now its location is a complete mystery. When this was first reported, it was huge news, but then the hype kind of died off around the discovery and everyone just assumed that it would be a big story when they finally opened it, except they did open it just 10 days after discovering it, and the news fell completely under the radar. Given the weight of the sarcophagus, the workers decided to open it in situ. I just want to go through what in situ actually means because it's a common archaeological term and it will help you understand why it's important and what exactly it means. In situ is a term that archaeologists use to differentiate between how an artifact was found. For example, when you do an excavation in a rock shelter, you put all the sand into buckets and then you sieve the buckets and then you go through whatever rocks left and you find artifacts out of that. Those would go in a bag as sieve artifacts. The opposite to that is if you're excavating and you notice an artifact without disturbing it, you would take measurements in situ, which translates directly to in the original place. This is an important distinction because it gives us spatial data about the area that we're excavating in. For example, was there a huge cluster of in situ artifacts in the northern part of the trench? If so, maybe we should extend the trench that way. It might also tell us that this particular part of the area that we're excavating was used more intensively for whatever reason. It's also useful for analysts to know where an artifact came from. 
In my line of work where we deal with mostly stone tools, it's important to know if an artifact came from the sieve or in situ because if it came from the sieve it may have damage to the edges that analysts could possibly misinterpret as use. Most analysts can tell the difference between this but it is really important to know where the artifact came from. In situ samples are also really important when it comes to dating. If an archaeologist takes a charcoal sample and doesn't record exactly where it came from, you'll get a date from the charcoal but you'll have no exact position to assign it to and therefore you can't tell where the artifacts came from. Anyway, the workers decided to open the sarcophagus in situ, but first they had to remove the thick mortar that sealed the lid. They did this by using hammers to bang wooden wedges into the small gap between the lid and the coffin proper, but as the lid began to lift something horrific happened. After lifting the lid just 5 centimeters or 2 inches, an overwhelming, gut-wrenching odor wafted out of the sarcophagus that was so strong it forced the workers to completely evacuate the site due to fears that the fumes could be lethally toxic. After confirming that it was indeed safe to proceed and putting on some much needed masks, the team proceeded to lift the coffin's lid and when the gap was big enough, Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities of Egypt, Mustafa Waziri, was the first to peer inside. He was greeted by a thick red liquid that was later identified as sewage, which they claimed must have leaked in after the coffin was sealed and buried, but I'll come back to this. Satisfied with what they found inside, or perhaps absolutely disgusted and completely turned off and not wanting to deal with it anymore, the team decided that they would now lift the sarcophagus out of the ground using a crane. What you may have heard about the liquid being poured down the sewer is actually true, but what most outlets failed to mention was that samples of the liquid were actually collected and are going to be analysed to identify what exactly the liquid is and what it contains. Once the liquid was drained, the remains of three people and three thin sheets of gold with different inscriptions on each piece were revealed. Unfortunately, the skeletons were in very poor condition due to the liquid inside which would have dissolved any previous attempts that were made to mummify the remains, but they were complete enough for analysis. One of the skeletons was a woman between the ages of 20 and 25 years old who stood 164 centimeters or 5 foot 3 tall. The other two skeletons were male. One of them was between 35 and 39 years old and stood 165.5 or 5 foot 4 tall, while the other was between 40 and 44 years old and stood at 185 centimeters or 6 foot tall. As for why they were buried together, Mustafa Waziri says that it was most likely a family burial, which was a common practice in Roman Egypt during this time period. But who exactly were these people? Why were they buried in this enormous sarcophagus? While there was nothing inside the sarcophagus that hinted at the occupants' identities, the lack of a cartouche tells that these people were not royalty. Prior to the identification of the female body, it was thought that perhaps the bodies belonged to members of the military, but the Egyptian military did not typically include women with the rare exception of royalty. But since there's no cartouche, that rules that theory out too. So for now, their identity remains a complete mystery. However, the remains of these people can tell us a bit about their lives. The skeleton of the older male has a 1.7 centimeter or 0.7 inch circular hole drilled into the side of his cranium above and behind the ear. This is evidence of the oldest surgical intervention known to our species. Trepanation is a surgical procedure in which a hole is drilled, cut or scraped into the human skull in order to treat a wide range of ailments. According to a 2001 review of archaeological trepanation evidence, trepanation began around 10,000 years ago with the oldest examples coming from North Africa, Ukraine and Portugal. I wasn't able to find a more recent study but this appears to still be the oldest examples and the information seems up to date. In ancient times the procedure was done with a sharp rock such as obsidian or flint which was used to cut square shaped intersecting lines to drill or to scrape the skull away. However given how close the brain itself is to the skull the procedure came with a variety of risks such as brain damage, infection, bleeding out and instant death from brain trauma should the person performing the operation slip. It's thought that only about 40% of patients survived the operation. Despite these risks, trepanation appears to have been quite widespread with more than 1,500 trephined skulls recovered from the Neolithic period which runs from 7,000 to 1,700 BCE. This represents somewhere around 8% of all the skulls recovered from that time period. Sample size is always an issue with these kinds of things, but this seems to indicate that it wasn't an uncommon practice and we even use trepanation in modern medicine. There were a number of comments on the TikTok video I made about this topic, for example, from people who have had the procedure done themselves. Beliefs surrounding trepanation vary from treating head pain, head injuries, relieving intracranial pressure, to the belief that evil spirits infecting one's blood could be chased out of the body through the hole, which, whether you believe in that or not, it's a pretty metal way to cure an illness. 
Examples of trepanation are actually not that common in Egypt, but given its antiquity and widespread use, it's no surprise that the Egyptians, pioneers in the field of medicine who were the first to describe cranial anatomy, document the role of the spinal cord in the transmission of information from the brain to the body, and invent stitching among other medical advances would also have trepanation in their arsenal of procedures. What this tells us about the person inside the sarcophagus is that they were both wealthy enough and important enough to afford and warrant this type of surgery. If it wasn't that common in Egypt, they would have had to find a specific person to do it, and this meant that they were probably suffering from an illness of some kind that made the risk to their life seem worth it. Without any further data, this suggests to me that this person was most likely an upper class citizen, especially given the size of the granite coffin that they were buried in. Now inside the coffin, archaeologists also found three inscriptions incised into sheets of gold. Dr. Jack Ogden, who did his PhD on Egyptian gold jewellery but was not part of the project, says that the three symbols have different meanings. The first is a depiction of an unhooded snake such as a python, which he says has connotations of rebirth since snakes shed their skin and are symbolically reborn. The second shows a palm branch or ear of corn, which are both common motifs representing fertility and rebirth in ancient Egypt. Now I know what you're thinking, because this happened on TikTok. I thought corn was a New World crop, how could it be in ancient Egypt 2000 years before the New World was discovered? Well, the term corn actually only specifically refers to maize from the Americas in countries like North America, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and some parts of Europe. Everywhere else in the world, corn refers to any cereal crops such as wheat, barley, oats, and rye, and this is how the Egyptians used it and it's how it's used in this context. The last drawing is a little more complicated and scholars are unsure as to what exactly it is. I'll do my best to describe it, but if you want to see what I'm talking about, you'll need to look it up on Google or go check out my videos. Now to me it looks like a head of garlic with the roots still attached, surrounded by a particularly Roman or Greek temple with the low wide triangular roof and the pillars on each side. Dr. Ogden, who wanted to emphasize that he can't be certain what the drawing depicts, said that it may be an opium poppy within a shrine and that opium was widely used in Greco-Roman Egypt for medicinal purposes. I think this interpretation makes the most sense given that the taller male recovered from the sarcophagus was suffering from a medical condition that was debilitating enough to risk trepanation, meaning they were probably in some sort of chronic pain that warranted the use of opium. This condition possibly even led directly to their death and how they ended up in this sarcophagus. Unfortunately for now, that's all the information we have. The archaeologists working on the project are planning further analysis of the remains including CT scans to detect things that are not visible to the naked eye such as injuries, diseases or other deformations, and DNA tests are scheduled to see if the skeletons are related. Before we end though, I have three burning questions. The first one is about the liquid inside. The team says there was a small crack in the lining of the sarcophagus and that the liquid inside leaked in through a sewerage pipe above the coffin after it was buried. If this is the case, why was there no smell before the coffin was opened? If there was a hole in the coffin that allowed the sewage to leak in, that means that it was big enough for the smell to get out and for the liquid to drain. It would seem logical to assume that there would also be sewage visible in the soil around the coffin if not on the sarcophagus itself. But the biggest one for me is the smell. If the smell was so bad that it evacuated the entire site when they did open it, why could nobody smell it beforehand? I don't have an answer to this question. I don't know of any mummies that were interred with liquid inside the sarcophagus, and I don't know if liquid could survive without evaporating for 2000 years inside. But the sewer leak also doesn't seem to explain everything here either. And I think the fact that they took samples shows that they're not entirely confident about what it was either. The second question I have is about the timing of the internment. The archaeologists working on the sarcophagus believe that the bodies were buried at separate times because they were stacked on top of each other. That's all the information they gave as to why they believe that. Remember what I said about burying someone, then digging it back up and putting someone else inside, then burying it again? Yeah, exactly that. Since we know that there's been no carbon dating or CT scans on the skeletons, I don't know what led them to this conclusion. Even if these people were buried at the same time, it seems logical to me that the bodies would need to be stacked on top of each other because the sarcophagus is only 1.5 meters or 5 feet wide, including the thickness of the walls, and there would be no way to lay three people shoulder to shoulder in this space. The practice of reusing burials isn't super uncommon, but this leads me to my next question. Why is this here? It seems as though this sarcophagus was just lying out in the open and if you take the team's word that these people were all buried at different times, they put the body in, leave the coffin out in the open, they came back, they put another body in, they left it in the open a bit longer, they came back, they put a third body in, and they just left it there. There's nothing around it to explain its existence in this location, there's no context. 
These kinds of things are usually found in temples, crypts, tombs, whatever you want to call them, there's usually some kind of building associated with a burial from this time period. But this appears to have just been sitting out in the open until it was slowly buried by the desert sands over 2000 years. Context is everything to archaeology and we just have absolutely none in this case and it's kind of driving me crazy. I just want to get in there and excavate around this thing in a 50 meter radius to see what else is down there. But for now there are no plans to do that and since this was first discovered in 2018 and it's now 2023, I'm not holding my breath for further analysis. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Unearthing Histories, and thank you to everybody on TikTok who has encouraged me to get this off the ground by liking, sharing, following, and commenting on all my videos. If you'd like to get more content, you can follow me on TikTok and subscribe on YouTube. I also stream on Twitch four times a week, and a link to all that is in the show notes. Thank you again, my name is Zane, and this has been Unearthing Histories.